I'd like to welcome everyone back. What we're going to be doing today is discussing administrative law. What is it? How can we conceptualize it? What is, what's a good theoretical framework to kind of understand it as a whole? So in many ways, this lecture is going to set up the rest of the class in analyzing how administrators utilize the three powers of government that has been given to them, and how do we justify that on constitutional grounds? Because one of the key principles in the Constitution is separation of powers. Now, what we're going to quickly discover, encapsulated in administrative law, is that administrators have been given all three powers of government. They've been given the power to make rules, to interpret them, and to execute them. Now, this gives them the power of the executive, the legislative, and judicial branches. How do we justify that when the Constitution divides them for the three branches of government? So that's our task for this particular material. So in getting started, let's kind of discuss what is public administration. So let's kind of separate uh, the two words and just first talk about what does it mean to be public. So. Although there are a variety of good definitions, what we're going to use is the idea that they are, it is a government-defined interest. And the big question is, if it's government-defined, who influences it? Who shapes it? Is it politicians who mainly form it? Or is it lobbyists? Is it powerful corporations? Is it citizens? Is it judges? Or is it all of them who kind of contribute in their own special way? But kind of, if you look at it maybe from a more realistic and nuanced perspective of what you see is that there are a variety of players that kind of define government interest. And if that's the case, for administrators, whose government interest do you follow? Do you follow the president, who usually has his own agenda, or Congress, who often has a multitude of different ideas, or the courts, that it's similarly kind of divided in um, a multitude of different perspectives? And what about administrators themselves? Do they create their own interest? Do they define it? And what we're going to quickly discover, at least in the administrative law context, that they do. Looking at the second aspect of the definition, it's this idea of what is administration. And administration is a notoriously difficult word to define, and that's because most people understand it as managing people to do complex jobs instead of organizing people to do complex jobs. Management is very much a narrow consideration that looks at efficiency, effectiveness, and economy. When you look at the word organize, it's, much broad, it's a much broader term that encompasses other aspects of administration outside of management. So when you look at it from an administrative law perspective, administrators often have to organize around constitutional rights such as due process and the rule of law. And so when you consider that you must organize along um, the rule of law and constitutional provisions, it becomes a much more nuanced concept. So the ideals of management, of, of managerial effectiveness and efficiency, often have to work alongside this idea of the rule of law, which changes the idea of what we traditionally understand, what it means to organize. And so in organizing in such terms, we value other things such as fairness um, and rights. And so when we put this together, what we get is public administration essentially meaning that you organize people to do complex jobs in pursuit of a broader government-defined interest. Now, there are other definitions of public administration, such as the accomplishing side of government or the application of state power. But what we really want to do is focus on this first definition of organizing, because organizing is going to be able to provide us with a theoretical leverage to understand administrative law and all of its implications. So when we look at the intersection of administration and law, what we quickly discover is Rosenblum begins to kind of articulate a theory of how we organize in such a manner. And what we quickly discover is that administrators make law, they execute that law, and they interpret it. So it becomes very important to be grounded in all three areas if you work in the public sector. So this basically makes administrators managerial, political, and legal officers. So now in terms of the legal, 
This is why it's important to begin understanding of how to interpret the law. And that's kind of why we went over Scalia and Breyer's approaches to kind of give you the theoretical concepts of how you approach certain issues um, that are related to the law in general. Now, when we look at the, the intersection, what we quickly realize is that administrative law is a body of constitutional provisions and statutes, court decisions, executive orders, and other directives that one regulates how agencies make rules. So that's one of the key pillars of administrative law is the ability of agencies to make rules. Then also the ability to enforce and execute the law, which is very much an, uh, an executive managerial dimension to what administrators do. And then um, to the extent that they're open to public scrutiny, and that kind of gets to the democratic aspect, that they should be held accountable to politicians and to the people for what they are doing. And that also gets to this last aspect of agency review. Now, for the most part, when we consider review, it's judicial review. It's judges analyzing whether administrative action is um, legal and constitutional. And when you look at it from this perspective, what we quickly realize is that our constitutional system sets up a government that is first and foremost designed to preserve and protect individual rights. That is its primary obligation. Its secondary and ancillary benefit is this idea is that the government is also designed to promote the public good. But that is secondary to its primary one of protecting and preserving individual rights. So our whole system of government, if you go through Article 2 and Article 2, Article 1, Article 2, and Article 3, well, we quickly realize that it, the, the constitutional document is designed to limit government power. In particular, it limits government power to avoid it from becoming arbitrary and capricious. That's the worst thing for a government to be, is to be arbitrary and capricious. To avoid that, you have the rule of law. And in implementing the rule of law and executing it, you have administration. And so the founders discussed administration quite a bit in a document called the Federalist Papers, which is a document written by Alexander Hamilton, Madison, and John Jay. It provides kind of the philosophical grounding to the Constitution. And in that document, it basically mentions administration 127 times. And they make a very interesting argument. They argue that good government produces good administration. Now, in this document, they define administration in two different ways. The first definition is the traditional definition we assign to public administration. It says, in its most usual and its most precise significant signification, it is limited to executive details and falls peculiarly within the province of the executive department. So in other words, basically what they're saying is that Public administration should be defined as a managerial context. However, they provide a second definition that is more encompassing, more broad. They also note that administration comprehends all the operations of the body politics, whether legislative, executive, or judiciary. And this is the critical part here, is that administration contains all three functions of government. The ability to make rules, to execute the rules or enforce them, and also to interpret them. Now, in putting this in administrative law context, what we quickly realize is that, again, administrators have the power to make rules, to adjudicate disputes, and to also have their decisions be reviewed. And so what we see is that administrative law rests on three pillars. The ability to make rules, the ability to adjudicate orders or issue orders, something that a court usually does, and also have their um, decisions be reviewed by an external body. Usually that's the, that's the judicial system. Now, looking at administrative law from these three prongs or these three pillars is what we see is that administrators make three decisions. The first one is usually related to adjudication which we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks. Adjudication um, makes decisions from a retroactive standpoint in the sense, basically, they try to resolve a past or previous dispute. You know, was a corporation involved in false advertising? Or did a network, um, whether the network show guilty of indecency? So it's looking at a kind of a retrospective model to adjudicate disputes. The second aspect of related to the decisions that they make is 
prospective or something that they do in the future that's going to apply in the future. So should the FAA require child safety seats on a particular plane? And the final one is kind of eligibility decisions or present decisions of whether someone qualifies for food stamps, Medicaid, Medicare, early retirement, and for other social services. Now in analyzing these decisions and basically what the government has done is set up processes to review um, these decisions. And so what you have at the administrative level is something called an administrative law judge, an ALJ, which basically oversees some of these hearings and where these decisions are made. At the presidential level, at the executive branch, you have OMB, who reviews a lot of the rules that agencies make. So you have Congress also involved with their review process. And then you also have um, judges through their own system analyzing and reviewing what agencies are doing. And so all of this comes about, this whole system and structure that we've talked about emerges with the Administrative Procedure Act of 1946. And what this particular statute does is create the concepts of rulemaking, adjudication, judicial review, sets it up, analyzes it, outlines it, and basically dictates how this is going to happen. Now, in putting this in a broader theoretical framework so we can understand it, is um, we're going to be using Rosenblum's retrofitted state. And what he does is basically des design this theory on a two-prong approach. And basically, what he argues is what the APA did, the, Admin the Administrative Procedure Act, was infuse constitutional values into the administrative state. So in order to make it legitimate, especially... Um, in light of separation of powers concerns is what is going to happen is that um, constitutional values are going to be infused within these administrative operations. And then the second aspect is to fold administration into the separation of powers framework. And so what happens is basically that an administration becomes subordinate or an extension of the three branches of government. So Rosenblum outright rejects any notion that administration is the fourth branch of government. When you think of the fourth branch of government, what that basically means is that you are independent and autonomous. You have um, these powers that are distinct and different than the other branches of government. Well, you don't see that, according to Rosenblum, with the administrative state. What you see is that powers have been given to them, that they are basically an extension of their three constitutional masters. So one way to understand this is this um, model right before here. So what happens is basically the president delegates or gives his power to administrators, which is the power to implement, to execute. Congress gives their power of rulemaking to administrators, and courts give their power to adjudicate and interpret the rule to administrators. So once again, you have all three powers of government coming into the administrative state. So let's kind of separate this out a little bit and look at the bureaucrat as administrator. And this is very much part of the, um, the administrator's executive function. And the executive function is deeply tied to management. The president issue orders, issues orders and expects those orders to be filled out in a faithful and effective way. Now to ensure that the president does all sorts of things, he has political appointees, um, he has department heads, department secretaries, all of these things to ensure that the president's vision is carried out. And what you have in most of your classes is a focus on this managerial dimension. For this particular class, we're not going to focus so much on the administrator as executive. What we are going to focus more on is this idea of the bureaucrat as a legislator. That Congress gives administration the power to make rules. And they delegate their power... And so what we see is agencies like the FDA have to determine how many peanuts are needed to be in peanut butter or um, what is exactly indecency on the networks. Or the EPA has to determine how much pollutants can be released into the air before a violation occurs. And so what Congress says is assign particular jurisdictions to agencies. So the FDA is given jurisdiction over food and drugs. The SEC is given jurisdiction over financial matters. And within their jurisdictions, they can begin to make rules. 
And in order to make a rule, what they have to follow is process, which is found in the APA or the Administrative Procedure Act. And so usually what has to happen is they have, administrators have to provide notice and comment. They have to notify the interested parties that a rule is going to be made. The rule has to be properly stated, then it has to be promulgated to the affected people. And again, a rule is tied to future effects. It often generalizes and classifies. And so that's kind of the raw power that administrators are given. But also, administrators are infused with constitutional values. In particular, is that they are infused with congressional values. So when you look at members of Congress, you want members of Congress, when they make law and rules, to be open and to be transparent. Rules can't be made in the back room. They have to be made open in the public um, space. And so what you want when administrators to make rules, you have to infuse those values. So they have to begin to think and act like legislators. So administrative rules have to be open and transparent. Just like legislative rules, you want participation. So administrators have to include participation from outside factors. And then representation becomes important. Um, we want our elected representatives to think as we think and feel as we feel. Well, in many ways, we want our bureaucrats to also think as we think and feel as we feel. Although that may be a little difficult, that's the ideal. And participation kind of helps that out. So in this way, is what you see is administrators are infused with these legislative values, which come into conflict, which is important to note, with managerial values. So if you're having to happen, happen to have a lot of deliberation, a lot of citizen contact, then that limits your ability to be as effective and efficient that you might like to be. Now, the third aspect is that bureaucrats become judges. They have to act like a court. They have hearings. They have to follow process. In essence, they have to adjudicate disputes. And what this often is called is judicial, the judicialization of administration. So just like administrators had to act like legislators, administrators also have to act like judges. So basically, this is the process by which the court tends to shape administrative agencies in their own image and likeness. And they have to shape them in their own image and likeness because they have to interpret the law. So therefore, they must act like courts. As a result of this, they have to become little judges. They have to slow everything down in order to protect basic rights. And so what we see, again, is an imposition of particular constraints on the administrative process which again impacts both the legislative and managerial dimension to administration. So you kind of see why we use this word organize when we talk about what is public administration. You're organizing things along a legislative, executive, and judicial standpoint. And how they interact is very complicated. So kind of to reaffirm this idea of the judicialization of administration, we're going to briefly go over kind of the Morgan cases because this is a good example of how courts begin to make administrators in their own image and likeness. So this particular case, it went before the Supreme Court four times. Now, this is just a side note, but the district court that issued these rulings lost all four times. So basically what you have is Morgan challenges the USDA's procedure for following um, basically a commodity rate order, which in other words is basically the rate of buying and selling livestock in Kansas City stockyards. So there's a challenge to a particular order that the USDA has released about the cost of livestock. Now the first go around is um, the USDA issued an order only after a full hearing. Now Morgan, the person who's complaining against um, this particular administrative agency basically said that the secretary had not personally heard any of the evidence. So if the secretary, the person who's making the decision, hasn't heard any of the evidence, how can they make a decision? Well, the Supreme Court said because the secretary had not heard any of the evidence, basically that the hearing that they conducted was illegal. So the first principle that's established, it's very much a judicial, a judicial concept, is that the one who decides must hear. Now the court notes, and this is very important, that the secretary could rely upon aides, rely upon delegates to help him um, know what is being discussed. 
And so what the secretary can do is basically dip into the record, that the secretary must understand the facts of the case. So after this is decided, the secretary must be able to hear the case before they make a decision, which is completely obvious, um, but that doesn't stop it. So we're going to have a second go around. With the second go around, once again, the USDA didn't provide adequate notice of proposed findings and rec recommendations. So what this did is basically prevent Morgan, who finds fault with the USDA, from challenging the particular record. It violated the concept of fair play. So administrative agencies have to, before they can act, they have to provide adequate notice. And that becomes critical. Anytime a court acts, they have to provide notice to an individual. Now, the third time really doesn't matter for our concerns here. The fourth time around, what we see is that the secretary is questioned to what to determine to know what he knows about this particular case. They put him on a train and they cross-examined him. And when it finally got to the Supreme Court, they said, whoa, wait a second. You cannot treat a secretary or an administrator like this because they are very much like a judge. And no judge is cross-examined um, to determine what they know about a case. And so basically, wait again, you're seeing is this process of judicialization that you have to treat an administrator like a judge. But what we see here in kind of summarizing the Morgan cases is that the imagery of the courts, all of its trappings, all of its glory, all of its allure is being opposed upon administrative agencies. And what's also interesting to note is that the first decision of these Morgan cases was done by a conservative court. By the time we get to the fourth decision, it was made by liberal judges who have kind of favored the regulatory state. But what the commonality between the kind of first and fourth court is, fourth cases is, is that both of them, both conservative and liberal, likened the administrative state to a court. So in many ways, and this is an argument that Rohr makes that you can contest, um, and his recounting of this judicialization of administration, that it doesn't necessarily mean the degradation of administration. That in fact, it legitimizes administration because it upholds constitutional values. And so what we see with the Morgan cases here is kind of the process of how judicial values become infused with administrative agencies. Now, I'm kind of continuing this um, thread of looking at how constitutional values are infused into the administrative state. What we come to is the difference between a rule and an, and a, a rule and an order. Now, the APA, the core of it, the heart of it, is the separation between what is a rule and what is an order. And by understanding these distinctions, we begin to see how administrators often have to act like judges how they often act to act like executives and legislators. So, in many ways, adjudication basically means that administrators have to act like judges, while when they act in the process of making rules, they have to act like legislators. So again, adjudication um, is an order that's tied to a specific rule, while rulemaking looks for a general norm. So one quick example of the distinction between a rule and an order. So I can say a Lindsay will turn off the light when we leave the classroom. That is an order. It's specific um, to a particular person and resolves a particular dispute of who will turn off um, the lights. Now, if we did a rule, it would sound a bit differently. The last person who leaves the classroom will turn off the lights. It's general um, and it's future oriented. Now, both are authoritative commands, but yet they are distinctively different. Now, when you issue an order, you have to act differently than when you issue a rule. Because again, when you issue a rule, you have to act like a legislator. And when you issue an order, you have to act like a judge. So let's get to some concrete cases to kind of flesh this out a little bit. So let's go to the Endangered Species Committee court case, where the Supreme Court had to determine whether ex parte contact had occurred between the President of the United States and the Endangered Species Committee. Now, the APA forbids any improper communication from interested outside parties. So one of the questions the court had to analyze was whether the president was an interested person that existed outside the agency. Now, what's important to note here is that this is an adjudicative hearing. So administrators in their particular role are wearing the hat of a judge. Now, the president wants to see them um, because the president is interested in how they are going to rule. Well, they do meet with them, 
but the contact that happens is deemed improper by the court. And that's because the court ruled that the president was an interested person and was outside the agency. And therefore, contact was improper. So once again, because administrators have to act like judges, they should be independent from political influence when adjudicating. And that is utterly critical, that when you act like a judge, you can't have the judge having backroom conversations with interested parties. That taints the whole process. So even the President of the United States cannot influence a decision made when administrators are acting like judges. Now let's switch gears here and look at another court case. Um, this one isn't done at the Supreme Court level, but it's done at the D.C. Courts of Appeals. And basically the question here is whether it's appropriate once again for the President to meet with administrative officials. This time um, it's EPA officials and the President wants to discuss with them about sulfur dioxide emissions during rulemaking proceedings. Now the court ruled in this particular case that contact between the President and the EPA was not ex parte communication. That it was completely legitimate for the President to meet with the EPA. And the reason why um, serves an understanding of the distinction between rulemaking and adjudication. Now in this particular case the EPA is in rulemaking proceedings, not an adjudicative proceeding. So basically, administrators are wearing their legislative hats. So what the court ruled is that they recognize that with rulemaking proceedings, that these are political. Anytime you make a law, anytime you're going to create a statute, you want deliberation, you want openness, transparency, you want outside parties to make contact with officials. So what you get is in a quasi-legislative process, like when administrative agencies make rules, you want to get a process driven by openness and participation. And it is expected that politicians like the president or members of Congress will play a role. Now, once again, um, ex parte communication between agencies and politicians during adjudicative hearings is improper. These hearings need to be impartial, tied to the facts, and driven by fairness. But in this particular case, the agency was involved in the process of rule making. So to summarize Rosenblum's theory really quick, what he calls basically the retrofitted state, is you have all three branches of governments, the president, Congress, and the courts, infusing their particular values within the administrative state. And by doing so, by passing the Administrative Procedure Act, which kind of codifies all of this, is it incorporates administrative agencies into the logic or ethos of separation of powers. And so what we're going to be doing for the rest of the class is really analyzing how do administrators act like legislators when they make rules? How do they adjudicate? How do they issue orders? How do they settle disputes? So we're really going to focus on how they are judges and legislators and how they interact, what are the implications and consequences of having administrators conduct this. So let's get to the idea of also of how basically you read a court case. Um, because what we're going to be doing from here on and out is basically reading a lot of court cases. Now court cases can be very daunting to read. But once you kind of get over that initial threshold, they are actually very easy. They're legible, understandable, and very powerful. Because judges actually write in a very clear, persuasive, and powerful way manner. So when you get your Supreme Court cases and start reading them, the first section you come across is something called the syllabus. And basically this is the condensed version of the ruling. Now in all honesty, I don't like the syllabus very much when I first pick up a court case and read it. It's very difficult to understand. It's um, in essence, it's very difficult to really understand the meaning of what judges are saying. And so what I would recommend to do is kind of skip the syllabus and directly go to the majority opinion. And so with the majority opinion, what the justices do here is provide the facts of the case, which really sets the stage for you to understand the decision that they're going to come up with. And so what, what the majority does is all the justices who agree with a particular decision must agree on the reasons and the outcome. Now that's critical um, because with the concurring um, opinion that sometimes just justices release is that they agree with the majority, but then what they want to do is add another reason. And this additional reason is not 
agreed by the majority opinion. Now, something related to the concurring opinion is something called concurring in judgment. And so you have different reasons, but agree with the outcome. So this isn't just adding an additional reason. It is absolutely coming up with a whole new set of reasons that nobody basically agrees with um, but you. But you agree with the outcome of the decision. Now, with the dissenting opinions, which we're going to read, is they disagree often with the reasons and outcome. Now, there's something called the plurality opinion, where you have four justices sign on to the majority. You have one concurring in judgment and four dissenting opinions. And opinions like this do not serve as precedents. But in kind of going over, once again, of how to read a case, I would recommend going to the majority opinion. And when you read the majority opinions, what you're going to see sometimes the justices are going to have a lot of numbers, a lot of court cases that they use as precedents. Completely ignore those for right now. And just look at the text. Anything that becomes confusing, just ignore and get to the text. And if you do that, you'll see how clear these judges can be. And as you read these court cases, what's very important about them is you're going to see two usually two, sometimes more, competing ideas of how to interpret a particular dispute or conflict. And what I want to encourage you to do is side with someone. As you read the court case, and once you're done, think about it and say, do I agree with the dissenting opinion or the majority opinion? Or do I actually go with the concurring opinion? It's kind of develop um, some type of argument of who you agree with and why you agree with it. Again, I'm looking forward to digging into these court cases because they are really fabulous. And I don't want to oversell them, but I really enjoy reading Supreme Court cases because they, again, provide a clarity of thought and reasoned argument that we can imitate in our own writings to become clear and to become better thinkers and writers. Once again, I look forward to the discussion boards and to see your viewpoint on Rosenblum, whether you like it, whether you disagree with it, and maybe some of the implications and consequences of understanding administrative law through Rosenblum's retrofitted state.